our lives are fairly hectic, I guess. And uh, I don't know. And I guess we're gonna introduce chickens into the mix now. So. <laughs> I'd like to place an order. Witness, if you will, Gallus domesticus, the backyard chicken. A mere few pounds of feather, bone, and muscle. A creature regarded by many as a rather humorous, though not so intelligent, agent of food production. And yet make note of a most singular phenomenon now taking shape across suburb and city. From backyard eggs to man's new best friend, the chicken is forging a fresh place in the pecking order of human importance. Madison, Wisconsin, a tiny pet food shop, an ordinary Midwestern neighborhood, or is it? When I first opened my store, I sold dog and cat food. Sometimes random people would come in right away in the beginning and say, do you have fish food? Do you have bird food? No, no, it's nutsy mutts and crazy cats. I have dog and cat products. Uh, but very early on, people also started coming in and asking me if I carried organic chicken feed. And the first time I heard that, I was uh, confused. We started the magazine, its premiere issue, in February of 06. The initial issue, we printed 15,000 of it and we had hoped to have about eight to 10,000 subscribers. Within two weeks, we needed to print another 15,000 and then another 5,000 before the second issue was even printed. So a couple weeks later, someone else came in and said, do you carry organic chicken feed? And again, I said, oh no, actually I don't. But it started to happen more and more regularly. I decided to have this seminar uh, concerning chickens because I found that uh, they really enriched my life and I wanted to give that opportunity to other people. India uh, asked me to make some copies of some information that we were going to pass out and she said, well, you know, Gary, I think maybe we ought to, do you think we ought to have maybe 20 copies? And I said, oh, India, let's make at least 35. Was anybody really going to be interested in doing this? I mean, was my love for my chickens and and them laying eggs and eating the eggs and sharing the eggs with neighbors, was that really something that's going to be attractive to other people to learn about? As we were driving to, to the uh, location in Austin, um, she said, Gary, what if no one shows up? And I, I was going, India, there'll be, there'll be people there. And, and e indeed, I was wondering, too, will anyone show up? Pretty soon there were five people and then ten people. And we had youngsters and we had elders. And 
We had people that came in ties and people that came in shorts. You can imagine uh, our surprise at the turnout. We ended up with 200 people. With the proliferation of poultry periodicals and chicken chat internet sites, the upshot is clear. The urban chicken is finally coming home to roost. And then one day the Cap Times called me. I would put out a call to chicken owners in Madison and I think someone emailed me back saying that I might want to talk with Liz. I understand that you're going to be carrying organic chicken feed. <laughs> I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting thing because her pet store, Nutsy Mutts and Crazy Cats, you know, obviously it sounds like it's designed for dogs and cats. And so I said, all right, forget it. Yes, yes, you can put in that article that I will be selling organic chicken feed because I will have it by next Tuesday when that article will be out. hiding their chickens and, and keeping them for egg production and, and having this chicken underground. Did you have chickens before they were legal? Yeah. Yes, I had chickens before they were legal. I have chickens. I've had them for a very long time. And how long have you had chickens? <laughs> <laughs> Way before they were legal. That was 12 years ago. And how many did you have? I don't know. I don't, probably don't want to say. I think I had... Uh, I, let's just say I had around 20. I had a carpenter friend make a little coop in the back of my garage and I had a few chickens there and I talked to my neighbors and they were like fine with it. In fact, they thought it was kind of cute. I didn't know if anybody else had chickens in town and then uh, years and years later when it still was not legal, I had a garden tour for one of the nonprofit organizations and people would go on the garden tour and they would see the chickens. I thought that was really cool and it's amazing how many people said, oh, you have chickens too. And so I thought, if that many people are saying you have chickens too, there must be a lot of chickens in Madison. And we had six, six girls in the backyard and that was probably for about a year. I'm so close to a year. And then we got the call. The animal control guy came and said that he had gotten a complaint about the chickens and that whoever called was concerned that we were going to eat them. And he wasn't sure if chickens were actually legal or not, but because it was complaint, they had to automatically file it with the zoning. And he said, if we didn't hear anything in a couple of weeks, basically no news is good news, carry on as, as usual. But the day before, <laughs> and then two weeks is up, um, I got a visit from the zoning fellow and he said chickens were not legal and a coop was not legal. So we had to find homes for the chickens submitted for your approval. A seemingly symbiotic relationship between human and hen. For centuries, the two have existed in a relative state of peace and harmony. Notwithstanding, of course, the almost inevitable fact that one of the two usually ends up on the dinner table. Enter the decade of transition, the 1950s. TV sets and automobiles. Post-war hoopla brings the boom of babies and the migration of mortgages. A new vision is born of pink houses, green lawns, and chicken-free neighborhoods. Our feathered friend is exiled from suburbia and eventually relegated to the factory farm. Chickens are almost a cultural universal. Practically every society has some kind of domestic poultry. In Mexico, the chickens is 
It's everywhere. Everybody have a chicken in the house uh, for party, for care, or just for, for fun for the young, the, the children. My father, all the time when we go to the market and they buy uh, food for us, and uh, sometimes they buy me a, a little chicken, you know, when you go to the market, you see a, a some guys to sell, they have a big box, and you can see the small chickens rock around, rock around. They uh, feed it with a natural feed, organic chicken. It's a natural chicken uh, because you, you care, you see how it go up, and, uh, and uh, it is very, very healthy. Chicken is something which is very important. Like for me, coming from Africa, Everyone has chicken, and how important chicken is, I'm going to tell you that. When you have a very important stranger, the first thing you should do is this. Give him a chicken. Yes, give him a chicken. And those chickens can make somebody rich back there. Because you can put those chickens together, and they can grow and have some kids. And you take those chickens, you sell them, buy a goat. And that, that goat you can exchange that by a cow. You can get whatever you needed, you can travel, you, you, because you're gonna be rich because of that chicken. You can come to be a rich person. When I was a child, I was born in France, but every year we would go to the farm where my dad was born, and it was in the Alps. And there, there would be my cousin, he was a farmer, and he had chickens, plenty of chickens. And during the day, the day, they would be free. And every night, the wife of my cousin would gather them. And I'm talking about like 15 years, every year I would go. So every year there would be see this ritual for two weeks to see this woman going out and gathering the chickens. And what I noticed is that this woman who worked maybe for 40 years with chicken started to have kind of the shape of the chicken, like this round shape and little legs. and. It, it was very, very uh, uh, disturbing almost, like to see this kind of woman taking the shape of a chicken. And also when she would gather them, she would have this kind of same walk. And then the, the, the voice would be like almost tuned to the chicken. So, and the chicken would really know, so they would immediately come and, and go to the place where she wanted them to, to go. And it was like hilarious to see. When I was in Sri Lanka, we had uh, cows, chickens, a lot of stuff. When I was nine or ten, I started to have chickens. So the thing is, even though we can say it's for eggs and uh, food or whatever it is, sometimes it's like a pet, you know, for the youngsters, it's like a pet. They love their chickens, and if, the, if somebody's going to buy the chicken, then they, we had to cry, you know. So they've come along with us on our trip through history. During the Industrial Revolution, the late 19th century, as uh, people started moving more to urban areas, they brought their chickens with them and typically kept a few chickens in the backyard. The phrase egg money, you know, this was often uh, the housewife's extra money to make ends meet. Toward the end of the Depression, World War II, as uh, a lot of men went to war, a lot of women started working in factories, there really wasn't time to keep chickens. The emphasis went away from that. And after World War II, as the commercial poultry operation really took off, people were living in more suburban lifestyles, people were working more, and they just stopped keeping chickens in the yard. But the time is now, present day, and the resurgence is upon us. The urge to feel the soil is strong, the knowledge of how our food is grown is returning. And once again, the desire is here to reconnect with the flock and to bring them back, back to the city. I discovered that there was this organization, Seattle TILF, 
and they were actually having these chicken coop tours and that Seattle allowed three hens per household. Seeing the pictures of the chicken coops in Seattle got both Brian and I excited and geared up to, to get the, the ball rolling in Madison and get our own laws changed here. We uh, weren't really certain what we had to do to challenge the law or to change the law. Um, we did get a number of folks together who were chicken owners. Um, under a, uh, um, the name the Chicken Underground. So when I got involved and uh, I went down to the city council to a couple of meetings with, uh, with Brian and uh, we signed our petitions and uh, were there for, for support. We did email the alderman who had a neighbor who had had chickens for years and um, he was very interested in helping us out. The, the alder at the time I think was Matt Sloan was the one that, uh, that actually pushed it through. City Council meeting of May 4th, 2004 is called to order and the clerk will call the roll. Then on to item 8, creating sections in the Madison ordinances relating to keeping of four domestic fowl as an accessory use to a single family dwelling. Alder Sloan. On nearly every measure, if you put a chicken up next to a dog, we'd be crazy to allow dogs in this city. They're louder, they're more aggressive, and they put out a lot more stuff that's a lot more toxic than your average chicken. So if we're going to be a reasonable city and think about people living close to each other and the problems that we may, um, we may create, I think if we're not going to allow chickens, we may want to start getting rid of some other animals that we currently allow. And finally, if you're still concerned I'm happy to say UW Poultry Science has even weighed in on this with a letter which you should have all received mentioning that uh, chickens really aren't uh, that big of a deal. So I know some of you are not going to vote for this and I certainly respect that. I hope the majority of us do and um, maybe next year for the uh, holiday party we can have omelets. Thank you, Alder Sloan. Then the, uh the motion is to adopt with the amendments. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. Chair believes the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ordinance is adopted. Portrait of a chicken household to be. Meet Elizabeth and Dan, a young family about to take the poultry plunge. So this was Elizabeth's idea to get chickens. That's correct. Oh. No, well, you <laughs> no, I mean originally. I guess we had heard about this the fact the that they were legal. That we do. <laughs> we have a friend who has chickens, well. and she will not leave us alone. Every time she sees us, she's like, "When are you going to get your chickens?" I think that it's important for children to have pets. We don't really want any pets in our house right now, so pets in the backyard seem good. I also really like being connected to the food that we eat. We'll probably have to move that. We're gonna put the coop here. And then the run will go And then the run, the we're gonna maybe do some nice willow fencing, like bent um, willow branches, or something that looks nice. Like just right around the tree. I have had no livestock experience at all. Neither one of us has any experience with chickens. Friends have told us that if it doesn't go well with the chickens, you can always eat them. So. <laughs> so when I talked to the newspaper and said that I was going to be carrying organic chicken feed, I actually had to put a plan together to carry organic chicken feed. 
on the day that I went to pick up my chicken feed, my husband and I had to go to the dump and drop off some roofing material. We were on our way out and we had this huge semi behind us. We looked to the left and we saw this thing running along and we said, oh my gosh, it's a chicken. It didn't look like a very healthy chicken. It was a fast chicken, but not a healthy chicken. It didn't have any feathers and was very, very, very bright red. So Garrett got out and it was quite hilarious because initially he was running around chasing this chicken. He got back in the truck and said, I'm gonna need some help and I have to move the truck because there's a semi behind us. And I was laughing because I'm sure the semi guy was just cursing my husband because he's sitting there behind us and we're chasing a chicken around the dump. So we stopped our truck and wrestled up the chicken. I'm from a family that started one of the first rare breed hatcheries in the United States. My grandfather in 1917 started McMurray Hatchery and his name was Murray McMurray. He was in a family bank and he raised chickens as a hobby. As the depression came on in the 1920s, more and more people were interested in raising chickens and bartering back and forth because money was tight. And so he was able to actually create a pretty good business out of a hobby, which for him was very fortunate because in 1929, there was a run on the bank. If you've ever seen It's a Wonderful Life, you know exactly what happened with George Bailey when people come in to get their money out and they, you know, the money's loaned for people for other businesses or other housing projects and the bank's doors closed. So my grandfather had a wife and five children to feed and he was very lucky he was able to turn the chicken business into something that could support him and his family. My father remembers a story years later uh, when my grandfather took them all on the train to Chicago and he had them line up outside the big Federal Reserve Bank and spit on it because this bank wouldn't loan them money to keep their little bank open in Iowa. So that's my involvement with chickens is through my grandfather starting McMurray Hatchery, which is still a business that's ongoing today. McMurray Hatchery, this is Brittany, how can I help you? Hi, I'd like to place an order. Okay. What town are you in? Um, we live in Madison, Wisconsin. Your first name? Elizabeth. Okay. And what can I get for you? Well, we'd like two silver lace wind up. All female. Okay. Two buff Orpingtons. Okay. And 21 Aracanas. Okay. Will the chicks be shipped to my house? No, they're going to go to the post office, and then the post office will call you when they arrive. The reason that we can hatch eggs is because of mother nature. In nature, a hen will lay, give or take, an egg a day. And when she has what she feels is enough eggs, she'll, she has a clutch and she'll sit on them. And once she sits, which is called broody, her breasts will warm up and she'll also start giving off more moisture so that the temperature and the humidity is just right for hatching eggs. A mother hen will also turn her eggs all the time uh, so that the embryo will not stick to the outside of the shell. Here at McMurray Hatchery, it all starts out on contract grower farms that are in about an hour radius of the hatchery. On those farms, the chickens are raised and the eggs are collected. At the hatchery, we tray the eggs, we separate them all by breeds, and we put them into this, what we call the setters or an incubator. This week we're working with the red tags and the red, red slides. At that point, they're in there for two and a half weeks. They are brought out of the setters, transferred into egg flats, and moved to the hatchers. On Tuesdays, we pull the eggs out of here, put them on here two bars at a time. Then we wheel them into the hatchers from Tuesday afternoon until Friday afternoon. Uh, 
Uh, on Fridays, I pull chickens. On Saturdays, I vaccinate the birds. And then on Sundays, I clean this room. I feel a lot of pressure. We're under a time schedule. When the birds hatch, we have to get them out in a certain amount of time. And um, yeah, there's a lot of stress that goes along. In this room, they are sexing the birds for us, and on a busy peak of the hatch season, we'll sex about 80,000 birds in an evening. There's a couple different ways to sex birds. The original way was invented in Japan is called vent sexing, and the birds are um, picked up and tipped over. The sexers can, can look at their genitalia, and then they can tell you male from female. These birds are called black stars, and they're a cross between a barred rock pullet and a Rhode Island red cockerel. And one of the reasons that we do the cross is that they produce a nice big brown egg and very dependably. The other advantage is they're color sexable. And this chick that is all black would be a female, and this chick with the white spot on top of his head would be a male and so we can sex them very quickly male to female, which is an advantage. We ship in minimum of 25, and we do that because we need that many birds in a box for the birds to be warm and to make it through the male in good shape. But on a cold day, we may put 27 or 30 birds in to make sure that they're warm. My concern was that if I go get to the heat, if I get the heat lamp now, um, well, that's just going to minimize the amount of time that I could be on the camera for this. <laughs> Dan's not very handy, and I've never really constructed anything like a coop before. So, <sighs> sorry, I'm really stressed out about the coop. But what? I think we're going to do is turn the back half of my tool shed out there into a chicken coop. I think that's what we're going to do, and I think I'm going to ask my friend. Hold on. Hello? This is Elizabeth. Oh, that's fabulous. Yes. You're going to bring them? Sweet. Thank you. Bye. So great news. They're going to bring the chicks here in, in a half an hour. Okay, we're back. We got uh, two bulbs instead of one this time, just in case we have another accident. But it's a red 250-watt floodlight, so we're ready to go. Did you hear from the post office? Yeah, they're bringing them over. Oh, my gosh. When? Now. There's 25 chickens in there. Listen to the sound. Oh my god.
these chickens all day. <laughs> Who needs TV when you got chicks? <laughs> actually 27 chicks because they sent two extras in the box and um, we had them in the basement and they were in that swimming pool and after like three days they started to like look want to like look out over the swimming pool and like jump out. they hadn't quite started jumping out but they started jumping high my children had taken all the pine bedding and like spread it all over the carpet downstairs and then they were skip, like putting scoops into the feed and spreading that. So it really wasn't the chicks that were the problem, it was my kids. My friend Patty from the farm picked them up like four days later and I was really relieved to have <laughs> only four chicks. I was a little bit freaked out about building this coop and I just kept looking at this rabbit hutch thinking this is like perfect because I thought this will solve our problems, it will look nice, you know, it'll be all set up. And then while I got the rabbit hutch I looked at a picture of all the different kinds of rabbit hutch and they have like a two-story rabbit hutch with a ramp and a nesting box and you know so I still have to take back the first rabbit hutch but I ordered I ordered a second rabbit hutch yeah that's that's my style people will often ask me why a chicken and why a piano plague chicken why a piano playing chicken? I think it, uh, it dates back to uh, in the 70s. I went to uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, and just outside of town they had a, a place called Reptile Gardens, and they had quite a few trained chickens there. One played baseball, they even had a duck that played tic-tac-toe. And I came away with this dream that someday I'd like to train a chicken to play the piano. said, I would like to have chickens, I know nothing about it. So we thought there's kind of a challenge there to get people who don't know anything about chickens educated so that uh, it doesn't turn into a disaster which the city could reverse their decision. It's 31 acres and right in the front is community gardens and kids in the neighborhood from some of the different local community centers come to the garden once a week. As soon as they come to the garden they all run to the chicken coop to check out the chickens, see what they're doing. They're all city kids and a lot of them live in apartment complexes and had never seen a chicken, never touched a chicken. No, and she likes, she likes to 
like bug around. And we've talked about the role of chickens in the garden and using their manure and what they like to eat and their different body parts and things like that. Last week we had a hundred kids at the farm. All the kids will pet them and touch them, but not every kid will hold the chickens. People ask some pretty basic <laughs> questions. One of them is, do you need a rooster to get eggs? A lot of people ask me, well, will a hen lay eggs if there's no rooster around? And of course, I look them in the face, and if it's a woman, say, well, you do. Another one is, what do you do with the chickens in the winter time? And <laughs> those chickens are hardier than I am, <laughs> that's for sure. continue to lay eggs, uh, averaging the three hens, about a dozen and a half per week is, is what we're collecting right now. I did uh, purchase a heated base that uh, goes underneath a two to three gallon watering uh, system and allows them to drink it any time they want and I don't have to come out several times a day and chip out the ice. Another common question we get is about housing and what do they need. So I went and got the rabbit hutch because I thought this will solve our problems. It'll look nice, you know, it'll be all set up. No, wait, we're putting in the wrong one. We are? It goes up on top. Oh, that'd be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stop there. I'm going to move this one. Okay. Oh. Here's the one. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Aha! Aha! Next piece, Henry. On top. Thank you. Does this go on top now? Uh-huh. Because that's the hole where the, the chickens are going to come through. Once How we are the chickens going to fit through there? We're going to probably enlarge it a little. All right. And I hope it works. If it does, it's like a, you know, a pretty cheap solution. It's, you know, other than like building it yourself out of scrap lumber. I have never built a chicken coop and before, no. And we're still not. And we're still, we're bar barely coming together here. <laughs> This is the basic chicken house, and it's just made from two sheets of plywood. One of the things that we wanted to do was figure out a way to make it easier for people to keep chickens in small spaces. And what we've come up with is a pen that's totally made out of uh, welded wire fencing. And you just slip the little ring in there. Squeeze. That's all there is to it. If you aren't letting them out very much, to move it is a piece of cake. Well, the coop that we originally, you know, ordered, mail ordered, the, the rabbit hutch, uh, very quickly we realized that that was not going to actually work. It's way too small. It was way too small. The chickens hated the wire floor. That's pretty good. At some point, the chickens abandoned the rabbit hutch and just started roosting on the neighbor's fence. But then eventually I just went out and got some 
treated lumber and we sat out in the driveway and built the coop and it took a couple of hours and it turned out really well. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. We've been living up here about five and a half years now. Moved up, uh, get out of the heat of the blacksmith. It just seems stupid blacksmithing in 100 degree weather all year. Grits is uh, Alabama ice cream, you know, is, is like you, you eat a lot of grits growing up in the South. We can't get grits up here. No self-respecting Southerner would, would be caught dead eating quick grits. So we import grits from the South. Well, a bag of grits got tucked away in a corner of the cabinet and some moths found it. It was just heartbroken that these grits were going to waste. And I thought, wait a minute, grits is corn and chickens like bugs. These aren't wasted. This is chicken food. So cooked up a pot of grits, spread them out into a pan, flattened out and and uh, cut them up like brownies and, and fed them to the chickens. And it was hilarious. I mean, it's just corn. They love this stuff. It's like she's not really white. <laughs> Observe this little oddity. At your next dinner party or social engagement, quietly bring up poultry as a topic of conversation. Chances are good you'll soon find yourself on the receiving end of a chicken story. And this one takes place in Texas. I am a really dedicated wild bird feeder. I'm really religious about it. I just, one of the things that I give to the world is take care of the woodland birds around this property. And so um, I did my normal routine and I, I went and picked up one of the bird feeders from the hangar and walked to the bench and right as I was reaching down to open the bird feed can, oh! right next to it was this rattlesnake. Uh, about a four foot long rattlesnake. I jumped and yelled. The chickens were north of there and they heard the commotion and all of a sudden, a number of them came over to where the snake was and they kind of surrounded it and nothing seemed to happen and finally the snake started to move and several chickens got on both sides of it and started directing it. They're all kind of moving in this semicircle, kind of massaging this space where this, this uh, coil, where this snake is. And then by and by, the snake slowly begins to move out of its coil and down toward the grass. And if the snake veered a little bit, the chickens would get closer, the snake would rear up, and then it would curve another direction. And finally, they escorted it into the deep woods, away from the house, and we just were amazed. We couldn't believe it. And they went way beyond where I couldn't see the chickens anymore. That's how far they took them into the woods. It was something I've never heard of or seen before. I think my yell alerted them to danger. The way Indy and I deal with animals on this property is that we really develop a, a somewhat of an innate communication with them. And I think that they sensed a danger and, um, and I think that um, they were there to, um, to help. A lot of people say they can tell the difference between a, an egg from a free range hen versus a uh, commercial egg. Probably the largest difference is in the pigmentation of the yolk. 
Well, I've been uh, growing grass for the chickens for the winter since they, they're not getting any green food other than what we scrap to them. So they love grass. And I've noticed since they haven't had grass for a little while that their yolks are not as yellow. Well, what's uh, noticeable is because they're uh, able to free range a little bit, it, that by getting more of, or of the minerals and uh, uh, being able to, to eat other, something other than processed feed, that you notice the, the, the color of the yolk is, 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 is very, very rich. The first thing you notice is that there's the difference in the color of the yolks. Like the eggs have these bright orange yolks versus the supermarket yolks that are really yellow. And then there's a huge taste difference. Chickens and most birds will take pigments from their food and deposit them in the yolk. Um, and so if you're feeding uh, you know, grass and green leaves, leafy material, things like that, you do get a darker yellow, uh, orangey colored yolk. I think uh, most people have never met the people who produce their food. There's really a huge gap a lot of distance and I think that one of the reasons that there's renewed interest in raising a few chickens in your backyard is because of that gap and desire of people to have a little more sense of control over where their food comes from, over the quality of their food. We decided to test the eggs because we had read some of these other scientific studies that had indicated that there might well be differences in the nutrient content of, of eggs from pastured chickens. I think the most exciting thing about these results is the cholesterol. We have products that are marketed specifically to people who want to eat eggs but are concerned about high cholesterol. If indeed it turns out that the test results that we've been uh, getting are confirmed uh, and eggs from pastured hens have half as much cholesterol, in a way it's no surprise. I think the public is going to understand that, that you get what you pay for and, and paying a little more for a better quality egg that's raised uh, not only on a, on a more natural diet, uh, but in conditions that are far more humane. Uh, a lot of people, I think, would choose to pay more just to not participate in that, in that kind of a system. That is, I mean, it's pretty horrific. We're leaving the dump and we had to get weighed on our way out and um, now we have a chicken in the back of our truck and so my husband very nonchalantly says so uh, why are there chickens running around up there and we had only seen one if we had seen more we would have been there all day and she said uh, well when they get gassed at the farm some of them don't die Avian influenza is a disease of waterfowl and shorebirds that has existed for millions of years. It's a innocuous, harmless intestinal infection of waterfowl. Um, uh, the virus doesn't make the duck, for example, sick. Now, backyard uh, chicken production in Asia is a very different uh, thing than what we're doing here. In some places in Asia, People, uh, chickens are so precious that people actually bring them into the house at night and sleep in the same room with the chickens. Those circumstances environmentally are very different from someone keeping a few chickens in a coop in the backyard in the U.S. Those are people who are living directly with their chickens. They don't have the kind of separation between their livestock and their human life. Bird flu comes from Asia. That's where it's endemic in waterfowl and that's where it's jumped from the waterfowl into some of the uh, domestic poultry. Really just within the last uh, 
two, three decades or so has there been this intensification of poultry production of terrestrial birds, of land-based birds, so-called galliform birds like chickens, turkeys, etc., in southern China and Southeast Asia. And it's thought that it is that intensification that led to the emergence of this H5N1 strain. Generally, the flu virus uh, mutates every year and, and a new form is created. If it occurred, depending on the form, some were worse than others, but if it was a bad form, we would usually try to destroy all the flocks that had it and all those surrounding it to get rid of it. The biggest outbreak of bird flu in history was not in Asia, it was in Pennsylvania, 1983-84, 17 million birds dead, the costliest animal disease eradication in U.S. history. Uh, that occurred in, uh, in these, kind of blossomed out of these kind of intensive confinement units, these so-called factory farms. I can remember growing up on the farm, everybody had hogs, sheep, chickens, and cattle. Now, nobody has any livestock, or if you do, you have several thousand hogs instead of, a, you know, maybe 15 or 20. Same way with the chickens. It's all concentrated now. So if there is an outbreak, you've got a real problem simply because of the proximity of all the birds and or livestock uh, to each other. We find avian influenza viruses all the time in essentially every continent. Uh, the question is, what's causing the disease-causing variety? What's leading to the emergence of these highly pathogenic strains like we've never seen before and we really think it is indeed this industrialization process where we keep birds in these unnatural stocking densities, which leads for the virus to be able to acquire this kind of virulence. It just breaks my heart when I hear someone say, oh, well, I was worried about my grandchildren, so I got rid of my chickens. You know, this is not something that you need to do. Never once have we ever documented a single case of this low path to high path transformation ever in an outdoor chicken flock. People have been keeping chickens in their backyards for thousands of years. It's never caused a problem. Only in the last few decades where we've had these, this, this mass intensification. So for example, in China, in the early 80s, all birds were kept in these tiny backyard flocks. But decade and a half leading up to 1997 with the emergence of H5N1, there were then by 1997, 63,000 CAFOs, these concentrated animal feeding operations, these so-called factory farms, some farms of which were confining more than 10 million birds on a single farm. It's really a dramatic increase, not only in the numbers, but in the stocking density and a decrease in the hygienic conditions. When a bird is outside, there are a number of factors that dramatically decrease disease risk. For example, the UV rays and sun sunlight are actually quite effective in destroying the influenza virus. And so when you have chickens outdoors, um, as soon as that uh, the fecal material uh, essentially dries up, dehydrates, it's gone. If you follow standard cleanliness protocols like washing your hands. You know, make sure that the, there's no feces on the eggs. Having a dedicated pair of shoes that you wear out to, to take care of your chickens. Or keep a, uh, a jacket that you put on when you go out and work with your chickens and leave that there so that you can interrupt those uh, possible routes of transmission biologically. That'll do a huge amount to prevent any diseases from coming in. But even should some, you know, some splatter of duck manure flying over find itself in the backyard, and even if there was virus, it would be dehydrated to death in the breeze sunlight would destroy it. Even should a bird you know, pick up the virus, the virus is not going to spread. It's not going to just have enough animals by which to transform into a variety that would be dangerous to people or dangerous to other birds. One of my neighbor's father used to drive a chicken truck. And so I said, I know nothing about this chicken. What, I don't, what do I do with this chicken? She called her dad and he said, kill it. Kill it's diseased. You have to kill the chicken. So I said, well, I'm, I, I will kill the chicken if I know, if, it, if it's the better, for the betterment of the chicken, I will do what needs to be done. 
I brought her to the holistic vet center and I said people are saying that I should kill it but I don't know if it's diseased and I'm not really about killing things uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any advice for me so she looked over Consuela her nails were grown underneath her feet which is very common she was also debeaked the vet said that she was extremely uh, malnourished she was super super skinny and her breastbone was small she just said to make sure that I watched her and made sure she was eating well and not too fast and that she was digesting well and drinking water and she sent me on my way Big Tiny is the name of the chicken, and he was a buff Orpington, and he was just the biggest presence of the whole hen yard. I wanted to have more buff Orpingtons by him because he's really big, and so I put him and I think about three or four hens that are buff Orpingtons in this little love shack, like all to themselves, and I just let them do their thing, and they had their food and drink all to themselves, and I think they had a good time. And so they laid eggs, and after a few days, I started collecting them and stuff. And then when I had a whole bunch of them to put in the incubator, then I went ahead and put them back in. <laughs> Big Tiny, I took in, and I set him down. And when I came back, he was lying on his side. I was like, Big Tiny, and I, I ran over, and I'm like, no, no, and I picked him up. I ran him outside and set him down on the grass, and he, like, lifted his, his wings all puffed out, and then they all went down. And I was, I was like, I couldn't believe it, you know, because he'd had a really nice calm um, all this time, and then I've just figured he probably was too much sex. <laughs> like, he just, he, uh, he, you know, just overdid it. But, like, he died really peacefully, like he had a smile on his face. So then I had to have, you know, his portrait. And it made me not feel sad. I was like, he had a great last week, right. you know. It went out with a bang. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Before I had chickens, I did start collecting chicken art. And there's, I think, a whole group of people who collect chicken art. And there's, you know, I think actually even Martha Stewart had a whole article on chicken art. Everybody has a certain style. There's stuff that's really kitschy. But of course, I think I only collect the best. And there's little glass statues and there's paintings. And some of it can be pretty pricey. I've always been a big fan of shooting your own photo references, so I knew right away I wanted to get chickens when I got to this farm, and we'd have eggs, and I'd be able to paint it my own chickens, so I got a whole bunch of exotic different types of breeds, and then just started painting them, and I did a few of them so that I had something to show to submit to these different galleries, and I went around with my submissions to these different places to have a chicken show, and I sent off stuff, and I didn't get any response, but then the library said we'd love to have it.
people were just were really welcoming and a lot of people would come up saying, oh, I want to have chickens or I just got my first chickens and they were just talking about chickens all night. A couple of people who came up and took out um, like a little tiny photo album and they had their photos of their chickens in the photo album. And yeah, it made me feel pretty normal then because there were other kind of wacko chicken people out there. <laughs> seriously considering putting this in the movie, are you? Yeah. This is the hardest point with the chickens. Once we were building the coop, the chickens continued to roost, and we would have to go outside nightly and pick them up off of the fence. And they would flap their wings really <laughs> vigorously every time you grab them. You'd have to move them one by one back into the rabbit Yeah, it was hutch. like, chick, 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 like as you and picked was, them up. I think that was a period where we really were frustrated with the chickens and didn't really see didn't, I personally didn't think it was all going to be worthwhile. Yeah. Because that was a hard They thing. weren't laying eggs at the time. But, you know, when we look back at it, it was all mistakes that we made. It wasn't necessarily the chickens. It's been fun and it's been, I think, a really good experience for our whole family to understand where, in a very small way, but where food comes from and that you actually, you know, have to wait for it to grow or to an egg to be made and laid and that sort of thing in order to eat. It's just been very, like, I don't know, that's been very satisfying. Hey. Let me see it. <gasps> Yay! Hey.
It's been four months, and now I think she looks like a real chicken. So Consuela is definitely a survivor. If you think about it, she survived gassing from the farm. She survived being run over by a huge wheel at the dump. Um, she survived the dump, and she made it into a home. There's a little kicker to the story. We live in Waterloo, and we are not allowed to have chickens like they're allowed to have chickens in Madison. So we couldn't really hide a chicken in our backyard. I had to find a foster home for Consuela in Madison. I wanted to find a foster home because when we do get the ordinance changed in Waterloo, then we would be able to have chickens. And unbeknownst to me, my husband was trying to find a home for the chicken. My son-in-law called and said that he had a co-worker who had found a chicken in a landfill and it needed a home. She sent me an email to say, I'll take her. And I said, oh, I'm very sorry, you misunderstood. Um, I'm trying to find a foster home for her, not a home home, but thank you anyway. So I called Liz and said I'd be interested in hearing about the chicken. And as we got to talking, I started thinking this is also a really good news story about chickens, about egg factories, and about what happens to um, spent hens when they're done producing eggs. A front page article, which I was very surprised. I had no idea that I was going to be on the front page of the freaking paper. After the article came out, I've actually been very surprised at the reaction that I've gotten from people. A couple of people have come in and said, oh, I, I just, I've never been here before, but I, I know that you were um, the one who rescued the chicken. And I just want to hug you. Two people, hugs only. And then they left. They were fine with their hug. About the third day that Consuela came to our home, she immediately started laying eggs. And we actually got her a sister named Cosette. Consuela lays her egg around 1030. And then after that, Cosette goes up in the coop and lays her egg around 11. So I tend to feed them um, by hand because Consuela's beak, since it was a little, since it was clipped, it was, it's hard for her to really grab it. And so I found that when I lay the greens down, she just kind of pecks and she just grabs the whole thing, but it's more difficult for her to tear. And so I give them my bouquet of greens every morning to get them started on the right track. <laughs> And then I lay scratch out so that they can scratch. And, and that was one thing that was really beautiful to see. Consuela had never scratched in her life because she was always in a cage. And the very first time that she saw dirt was when she came to our house and she went ballistic. In my mind, we wouldn't have done anything differently. We would have picked up any living being that was in need if she had been sick or not doing well or had some type of chicken disease, I certainly would have, in a humane manner, put her out of her misery, so to speak, and I wouldn't have allowed her to suffer. But since she had a healthy heart and healthy lungs, it's, uh, why wouldn't we want to give her a chance? She's a perfectly happy little being, and if you met Consuela today, you would have no idea that she came from a factory chicken unless you knew what de-beaked birds looked like, but she's turned into a beautiful, wonderful bird who provides eggs for her wonderful foster home. We need to stop intensively confining these animals and move back to more traditional methods and raising a few chickens in the backyard isn't going to hurt anybody. I think the future is really going to be the small-scale backyard farmer. I love being able to go out there and walk back in with food in my hands. That's, that's the same reason we, we do the garden, just having those, those treats, uh, just the, the connection to the land. Again. If we can, if we can get enough of these breeders, enough small flocks going, we can recapture even genetics that we thought were lost. My whole experience with chickens um, I think has changed my life in that I had never really been part of the political process and um, our work to, to change the law uh, um, 
made a real believer out of me. I, I, I really didn't think that was something that was possible for someone like me to challenge the, uh, the city and, and make a difference. I think those people who dismiss chickens as, as being some strange um, oddity, I think should be around them for a while. They would discover they are a pretty interesting animal. There's a community out there of people who love chickens. Oh, I have these chickens, and oh, do you, have you ever raised these? And you're talking about the eggs, and you're talking about your coops, and you're talking about you know when you were a kid, and all of these stories. It's like I almost think of it as the, you know, it's a gay man. It's like, you know, they hit, there was a hidden community in the gay community, too. And then to think that there's others, there's hidden community in the chicken community. And so now they have a place where they can go and talk about chickens. They come running up to me most of the time when I go out to the barn because they're, they're looking for some grain and, and uh, uh, they've learned to eat out of my hand. And they all have personalities and that's what makes them special. You really like who they are. Chickens have this bad rap where people think they're really dumb and, and they can't do a lot of things, but they are very good at being chickens and they're very inquisitive, they have a lot of curiosity and they're very quick and they're very serious. Even when they're comical, they're very serious. And I think maybe that's one of the things I like about a chicken. They just Whatever they are, that's what they are at the moment. Everyone has a chicken story, even if you wish they didn't. All right.